Well, good morning, Calvary Bible Church family, and uh, I do want to begin by joining my voice in welcoming uh, all of, especially uh, the mothers, and wishing you a very happy Mother's Day. Uh, We know this is an unusual one uh, in our lifetimes, uh, but I am praying that this day will be really special for you, uh, praying that uh, even if you're separated from your children by distance, that uh, through FaceTime or phone calls, you'll be able to connect with them and and uh, really be honored in this day. I want to remind our mothers that Matthew chapter 6, verse 4 teaches us that the Lord is the one who sees and rewards the good which is done in secret or unnoticed. And mothers, of course, have many, many things that they do which go unnoticed and perhaps even unappreciated in this world. But I want to remind all of the moms out there that all of those unseen things, all of those things that you do for your children for your family. They're all noticed by the Lord and will be rewarded by Him. So, happy Mother's Day to all of our moms. Also wanted to just let the congregation know that for the past several weeks, uh, the staff and the Strategic Planning Committee have been working really closely with our medical advisory team to develop a plan and procedures for returning to in-person meetings safely. And on Thursday, the elders unanimously approved that plan And so on Friday, I sent a letter to the Kalamazoo County Health Department explaining our plan and inviting their feedback. And then yesterday, we taped footage for a video which will show the congregation what to expect when we return to in-person services. We'll be sharing that plan and the tentative reopening date with the congregation as soon as the explanatory video is ready. So stay tuned uh, in the weeks to come as we roll out that plan. And be in prayer as we take these important steps. Well, I want to invite you to open your Bibles to John chapter 8. We're going to be in the second part of John chapter 8, verses 43 through 59. And this is going to be part two of the message I began last week on the difference between fake faith and saving faith. What is the difference between fake faith and saving faith? Now, last week, we pointed out that John chapter 8, verse 30, says that as Jesus preached in the temple during the Feast of Tabernacles, that many came to believe in him. That's what John chapter 8, verse 30 says. As he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. But in the very next verse and the passage which follows it, Jesus makes it clear that not all of those people had genuine saving faith. Some of them had a shallow, a superficial faith, a fake faith. And we know that because as soon as Jesus taught something that they didn't like, they began arguing with him, even insulting him. And by the end of the passage, they're even trying to kill him. They pick up stones to try to kill him, trying to kill the one they had just shortly before claimed they believed in. And so last week, we began studying the difference between fake faith and saving faith, as it is revealed here by the Lord Jesus in John chapter 8, verses 31 through 59. And last week, we covered verses 31 through 42. This week, we'll be covering John chapter 8, verses 43 through 59. So last Sunday, we covered verses 31 through 42, and we covered the first five out of ten comparisons between fake faith and saving faith, which we have gleaned from this passage. So I just want to kind of walk you through them to summarize at the beginning, and then we'll go through numbers six through ten. First of all, fake faith is temporary, whereas saving faith is permanent. We saw that in verse 31. Secondly, fake faith falls for Satan's lies, whereas saving faith knows the truth. We see that in verse 32. Third, fake faith leaves you in slavery to sin, whereas saving faith sets you free, verses 33 through 36. Fourth, fake faith is based on inherited cultural traditions, whereas saving faith is based on a personal relationship with Jesus. We saw that in verses 37 through 40. And then fifth, fake faith loves false teaching, whereas saving faith loves Jesus. We saw that in verses 41 through 42. 
So today, we're going to see five more comparisons between fake faith and saving faith in verses 43 through 59. So let me just summarize them, and then we'll go through them. Number six is this. Fake faith cannot understand sound doctrine, whereas saving faith hears and heeds it. We'll see that in verse 43. Seventh, fake faith spiritualizes sinful desires, whereas saving faith transforms the heart. That's in verse 44. Eighth, fake faith is deaf to God's truth, whereas saving faith listens to God's word, verses 45 through 47. Ninth, fake faith uses ridicule to discredit the truth, whereas saving faith defends the honor of God. That's verses 48 through 55. And then tenth and lastly, fake faith is the primary motive of persecutors, whereas saving faith proclaims the truth clearly despite the risk. And we see that in verses 56 through 59. So let's go through those last five contrasts between saving faith and fake faith together. The sixth contrast between fake faith and saving faith is this. Fake faith cannot understand sound doctrine, whereas saving faith hears and heeds it. Fake faith cannot understand sound doctrine, but saving faith hears and heeds it. Look at John chapter 8, verse 43. Jesus says, why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. Why don't you understand what I'm saying, Jesus says. He says it's because you cannot hear my word. Jesus is saying that there is an inability here. They cannot hear, right? And to hear is not just to have the, the, the waves of the auditory sound coming through your eardrums. It means to really hear and understand, to hear and heed in your very soul. And they cannot receive the word, as it were. Why is that? Jesus says, you don't understand what I'm saying, and it's because you cannot hear my word. In verse 43, Jesus is talking about something which theologians call the noetic effects of sin. The noetic effects of sin. Now, that term noetic is de derived from a Greek term for the mind. It's basically saying that there are effects that sin has on the mind. Sin does not just leave your thinking untouched. In fact, sin is rooted in your thought processes. The theological term, the noetic effects of sin, refers to how sin impairs and hinders the human mind from understanding and accepting spiritual truth. Listen again to what Jesus says. Why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. Now, keep in mind that when he says this, he's talking to a group of people, which includes the scribes. These are the Hebrew Old Testament scholars of that day. I mean, this phrase, you don't understand what I'm saying and you cannot hear my words, had to be absolutely shocking. He's telling the most religious, the most educated people that they not only don't understand, they cannot understand. And Jesus says this repeatedly in the New Testament. Think of how many times when he's teaching in parables and the disciples ask him, well, why are you teaching in parables? And he tells them, because it is to reveal things to those who believe and to hide them from the lost. This phrase that you don't understand and you cannot understand is a direct hit against the religious pride of the scribes and the Pharisees. They thought that they were the wise ones. They thought they were the knowledgeable ones. And they thought that Jesus and those following him were the uneducated, the ignorant ones. Go back in the context of John chapter 7, verses 14 and 15. We'll see an example of this. 
It says, when it was now in the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. The Jews then were astonished, saying, how has this man become learned, having never been educated? You see, they thought that they were the wise and educated ones, and Jesus was just a foolish country bumpkin from nowhere Galilee. But the reality was exactly the opposite. They were the ones in spiritual ignorance. They were the ones uneducated in the words and ways of the Lord. They thought that Jesus was the fool and they were the wise ones when the reality was exactly the opposite. Look over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul is going to talk about this phenomenon, the noetic effects of sin. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, and then another section in chapter 2. I'm going to read it to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And then skip down to chapter 2, verse 14. A natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, right? This is the noetic effects of sin. A natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. You see, Jesus is saying, look, you don't understand what I'm saying, and you cannot hear my word. Well, why? It's because of the noetic effects of sin, right? Paul here in 1 Corinthians 2 says that a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. And listen, he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. You know, he's like a radio with no antenna. I mean, the radio waves are out there, right? It's not that as Jesus was teaching there at the Feast of Tabernacles that their eardrums weren't working, His words were passing their ears, but they didn't understand them and couldn't accept them. They couldn't really hear them. Why? The natural man doesn't accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. They don't have the antenna. The radio signals are there, but there's no reception. No antenna. Well, why? Because it is the Spirit of God, the indwelling Spirit of God, who enables a human heart to receive the things of God. That's why Paul goes on to say, He who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. And he concludes by saying, We have the mind of Christ. So what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2, and what Jesus talks about here in chapter 8, verse 43, is the noetic effects of sin. 
the blinding effects of sin and moral depravity on the human ability to understand and believe spiritual truths. Now, in addition to the noetic effects of sin, the Bible teaches that there's another effect on the human mind, and that is the direct effect of Satan himself, Satan and his deceptions. In 2 Corinthians, turn one book over now to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. In 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 through 6, we read this. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Again, the light is shining. The glory of Christ is shining. But it says that Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers. He has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, it says, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. You see, a blinded eye doesn't see. And the reason it doesn't see is not because there's no light to be seen, but because it has no ability to perceive that light. That is what goes on in the minds of unbelievers. They are blinded by the noetic effects of sin, and they are blinded by the deceptions of the evil one. And that's what Jesus is going to talk about next when you turn back to John chapter 8. He's going to talk about the role of Satan in deceiving and dominating the desires and the thoughts and the deeds of the lost soul. He's going to talk about Satan being the father of lies. So my friends, it is because of the noetic effects of sin and the blinding of the mind that comes through satanic deceptions. That the unbeliever, as Jesus says very clearly here in verse 43, cannot understand and accept God's word. He cannot. And this has huge practical implications for the way that we do evangelism and apologetics. What it means is this. You cannot using human logic and reasoning and all of those tools or rhetoric or whatever, you cannot argue someone into the kingdom of God. You may be the smartest Christian who ever lived, the best speaker, the best orator, the most logical. You may be an excellent debater. You can be many things, but one thing you cannot do is argue someone into the kingdom of God through human persuasion tactics. All of the arguments, all of the rhetoric, all of the evidence in the whole world cannot breathe spiritual life into a lost soul. You're like a broadcaster who thinks, if I just send a stronger signal, they'll hear the message. If they don't have an antenna, it doesn't matter whether you're a 10,000 megawatt station or a 50,000 megawatt station or a 100,000 megawatt station without an antenna, they cannot and will not receive the word. All the evidences and arguments in the world cannot breathe spiritual life into a dead soul. Now, God can and does use evidences and use logical argumentation to draw someone to himself. God can use those things, and he does. But in and of themselves, evidences cannot overcome the noetic effects of sin or the blinding power of Satan. That is something which requires divine intervention. 
divine intervention. And Jesus already told us this back in John chapter 6, verse 44. Listen to what Jesus says. John chapter 6 and verse 44. He says, no one can come to me. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Do you see what Jesus is saying here? He's saying, the lost soul cannot be saved by the persuasion tactics of other human souls. He's saying what is needed here is salvation. The lost soul must be saved. When you need to be saved, there's a helplessness there. If I'm drowning and I can get out of the water myself, I don't need to be saved, I just need to swim. But if I'm drowning and I cannot on my own, then someone external to me must save me, must reach down and pull me out. That's what God does for us in salvation. It's divine intervention. It's a love which initiates. It's a love which pursues. It's a love which reaches down into the water to pull us up out. And because divine intervention, divine initiative is necessary for the salvation of a lost soul, if we neglect the proclamation of Scripture and prayer in our evangelism and apologetics, and if instead we rely on techniques of human persuasion, then we have traded our most powerful weapon in the spiritual battle for our weakest one. Listen again to what 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says. Not this time I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. When I came to you, brethren, I did not come to you with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Now again, I don't want anyone to misunderstand me. I'm not saying that evidences have no role in evangelism and apologetics. They certainly do. But what I am saying is that the use of evidences should be secondary and supplemental to our main weapons of spiritual warfare, which is simply opening the Word of God and simply sharing God's Word, which is empowered by God's Spirit with those who are lost, and importantly, praying for God to open blinded eyes, to open the hearts of the unbelieving. So my friends, if you find yourself debating unbelievers rather than proclaiming Christ and Him crucified, something has gone wrong in your evangelistic and apologetic methodology. If you argue more than you testify, if you debate more than you proclaim, if you find yourself using rhetoric more than Scripture, you have probably swapped your primary and most powerful weapon of spiritual warfare for your secondary and weakest one. Don't forget that only God can open blinded eyes. And so we must pray. We must pray. And don't forget that Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So what do you need to do? You need to pray that God will open the blinded heart and then you need to proclaim Scripture to them. Open your Bible and say, look at what Jesus says here. Look at what this verse says here. 
Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Notice it doesn't say faith comes by powerful argumentation, great rhetoric, and a list of great evidences. No, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And here's the encouraging part. This means that effective evangelism and apologetics is within the reach of every believer. You can effectively and powerfully share the gospel with unbelievers. You don't have to have a PhD in archaeology or in science or whatever in order to be an effective witness for Christ. If you know the gospel, can articulate it, and you have the testimony of a changed life, you are ready to go. The word of God and prayer are our primary weapons of spiritual warfare, so keep them primary. I'm grateful for the apologists and the specialists within the church that help us in areas of archaeology and of physics and other ways to have good evidences. But again, those are secondary to our primary task. We see here in verse 43 that fake faith cannot understand sound doctrine because it's spiritually appraised. But saving faith hears and heeds it. Well, there's a seventh contrast that I'd like you to see in John chapter 8 between fake faith and saving faith. It's this. Fake faith spiritualizes sinful desires, whereas saving faith transforms the heart. Look at verse 44. John chapter 8, verse 44. Jesus says, You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Fake faith spiritualizes sinful desires. In fact, we could actually say here satanic desires where saving faith transforms the heart. Let me walk you through this. If you remember from last week, the Jews thought they were okay with God because Abraham was their forefather. But Jesus points out that their animosity towards him was incompatible with the faith of Abraham. Look at John 8, 37 through 42. Jesus says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I have seen with my father, therefore you also do the things which you heard from your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God, this Abraham did not do. You are doing the deeds of your father. And then he tells them, your father is the devil. You are of your father, the devil, he says. This is a crushing indictment. They're saying, our spiritual forefather is Abraham. He says, oh no, Jesus says, your spiritual forefather is Satan. The one who deceived Adam and Eve in the garden. And from that point on, he became the spiritual forefather of depraved humanity. You are of your father, the devil, Jesus tells them. He's saying, look, a son shares the same nature as his father. And you have an evil nature like your spiritual forefather, the devil. You not only share his evil nature, you share his evil desires. He says, you are of your father, the devil. And then he says, you want to do the desires of your father. You share not only his nature, but his desires. You want, he says, to do the desires of your father. You see, my friends, the lost soul does not just sin willingly. He sins eagerly. The lost soul does not just sin willingly. He sins eagerly. The lost soul wants to sin. The lost soul loves sin sin. He wants to do the desires of his father, the devil. He has something in common with the devil. 
What the devil wants, he wants. And it's exactly the opposite of what God wants. This is the doctrine of total depravity. The doctrine of total depravity. And it is taught throughout the Bible. Think back to Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. What God says about humanity says, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That is total depravity, pervasive depravity. Romans chapter 3, verses, verses 10 through 18, then teach us that there is no one good, not even one, not a single righteous person. And then listen to what Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and following says. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we all too, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. It's an amazing indictment. He's saying, look, you're dead in your trespasses and sins. You walk according to the course of a fallen world, and you follow the ways of the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan. And then he says that Satan is the spirit that is working in the sons of disobedience. Do you realize that satanic, demonic power is working, present tense there, working in the sons of disobedience? They are blinded by their sin and they are deceived by satanic power. Jesus is telling us here in John 8, that human beings are sinners both by nature and by choice. They're sinners by nature and by choice, right? Ephesians 2, you're by nature children of wrath even as the rest. But then it also talks about their choices, right? Indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Well, that's the same thing that Jesus is saying in John 8. You're sinner by nature and by choice. Look again very carefully at verse 44. You are of your father the devil and you want to do the desires of your father. The unbeliever is both of their father, the devil, and they want to do what he wants to do. That phrase, you are of your father, the devil, speaks to the sinfulness of our nature. And the phrase, you want to do his desires, speaks to the sinfulness of our choices. We are sinners by nature and by choice. We're of the devil and we want what the devil wants. But in our pride, we don't want to admit that. The people Jesus was rebuking in verse 44 considered themselves to be righteous. In fact, they spiritualized their evil desires. Here we see in the chapter that they wanted to murder Jesus, the Son of God. You can't have more hostility towards God than that. They wanted to murder Jesus, which is a desire that they shared with Satan himself, who Jesus says was a murderer from the beginning. They share Satan's desires, his goals. But yet they deceived themselves into thinking they were actually defending the honor of God. They not only failed to admit their sin, they spiritualized it. And that is a common trait of lost souls in this fallen world. What they desire is sinful and wicked. What is an evil desire? It's a desire for something that God says is evil. And nothing anyone can say changes the fact that if you want, if you desire what God says is evil, it's an evil desire. You want to do the desires of your father, the devil. What they desire is sinful and wicked. But they tell themselves and they tell everyone around them and whole societies that what they desire is neutral or even good. Again, there, as Isaiah 5.20 says, those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. But I want you to understand, beloved, that deceiving people into confusing evil and good is exactly what Satan does. That's his whole agenda. 
is to swap good for evil, evil for good. He is the great deceiver. And so Jesus says at the end of verse 44, whenever Satan speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And then he says to the people, because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Why didn't they believe Jesus? Was it because he didn't have a real powerful speech? He didn't have enough evidences? No, he says, because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. You see, the people simply hate the truth. They hate it. They don't love the truth so as to be saved, as Paul writes to, to the Thessalonians. Because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. You see, fake faith spiritualizes satanic and sinful desires. But saving faith transforms the heart, right? When saving faith comes in, the heart is transformed, and instead of hating the truth, you love the truth. And the Holy Spirit, the great teacher, helps you to understand and receive it. Well, we're almost out of time, so we'll briefly go through the last three contrasts here. Fake faith, number eight, fake faith is deaf to God's truth, whereas saving faith listens to God's word. Fake faith is deaf to God's truth, whereas saving faith listens to God's word. Look at John chapter 8, verses 45 through 47. Because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? And by the way, this is the sinlessness of Jesus. He's saying, look, none of you can point out a sin I've committed. Which of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, Why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason you do not hear them, because you are not of God. You see, a key mark of a genuine believer is a desire to hear the word of God. And again, that word for hear has the idea of receiving, of heeding. So my friend, if you have no desire to hear and read the Bible... If you find it boring, irrelevant, even off-putting. If it irritates you whenever someone shares Scripture with you, you need to ask yourself why. Why is the truth off-putting to you and lies so attractive? Jesus says, the one who is of God hears the words of God. If you don't hear the words of God, you don't love the words of God, you're not of God. It's a really simple test. He who is of God hears the words of God of God. For this reason, you do not hear them, because you are not of God. Belong to God, you'll heed his words. Don't belong to God, they'll be off-putting to you. Plain and simple. Fake faith is deaf to God's truth, whereas saving faith listens to God's word. Ninth, fake faith uses ridicule to discredit the truth, whereas saving faith defends the honor of God. Let's read verses 48 through 55. The Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. But I do not seek my glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died and the prophets also, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste of death. Surely you are not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. And you have not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say that I do not know him, I will be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Fake faith uses ridicule to discredit the truth, whereas saving faith defends the honor of God. In this passage, right, going back to John 7, in John chapter 7, verse 20, John chapter 8, verse 48, and in John chapter 8, verse 52, three times they accuse Jesus of being demon-possessed, of being demon-possessed. And in verse 48, they call him a Samaritan. That was a racist term 
that was considered the worst insult that a, one Hebrew could say to another Hebrew. To call him a Samaritan was the most horrific ridicule that they thought they could muster. Since they had no legitimate answer, no legitimate argument, they resorted to ridicule in a weak attempt to discredit the truth. And ridicule is the last refuge of the weak mind. Unbelievers today do the same thing, don't they? They try to drown out God's truth by shouting insults and ridicule. They may not use the word Samaritan, that's not the insult they would prefer, but they sling the ridicule to try to discredit the truth. And we shouldn't be surprised when they do that. They did it to the Lord, they'll do it to us. They called Jesus a demon-possessed Samaritan. Can't get any lower than that. So when the world slings insults at us in a desperate attempt to discredit the truth, we should simply do what Jesus did in response. He gently, lovingly, but very firmly defended the honor of God. Fake faith uses ridicule to discredit the truth, whereas saving faith defends the honor of God. Well, tenth and lastly, fake faith is the primary motive of persecutors, whereas saving faith proclaims the truth clearly despite any risk. Look at verses 56 through 59. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Chapter 8 ends with some of these so-called believers picking up stones to try to kill Jesus. And that's the way it's always been. Yes, atheists and secularists through history have done their fair share of persecuting the body of Christ, and they're doing so even today in some secular and atheistic countries. But if you study church history, you'll realize very quickly that it is actually religious persecutors who have killed, imprisoned, and tortured more genuine followers of Christ than anyone else. It is fake believers who are usually the responsible for the worst forms of persecution. The number one motive of persecutors is usually false religion. Whether it's the Spanish Inquisition, the Counter-Reformation, the Reign of Bloody Mary, the Slaughter of the Huguenots, all of those are examples of false faith being the primary motive of persecutors. And Jesus warned us that that is exactly what would take place. In John chapter 16, verses 1 through 3, he says this, These things I have spoken to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcast from the synagogue. And an hour is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering service to God. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. They will think they're serving God when they kill you, he says. But notice that even though this passage shows Jesus knew they were trying to kill him, he still proclaims the truth very clearly and unambiguously. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Jesus here is saying that he existed before Abraham, which is a clear claim to the divine attribute of eternality. And he again uses here the phrase ego in me, the Greek translation of the sacred name of God. Despite the imminent danger to his life, he declared the truth clearly and boldly. So if we want to follow in his footsteps, we must do the same. So no matter whether the world applauds us like they were doing in chapter 8, verse 30, or trying to kill us like they were doing in chapter 8, verse 59, very short period of time in between those two things, whether they applaud us or are persecuting us, our mission is one and the same. We need to speak the truth in love. Speak the truth clearly and boldly. Saving faith proclaims the truth clearly despite the risk, but fake faith is the primary motive of persecutors. Well, in these two passages, we've seen ten contrasts between fake faith and saving faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 says, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourself. So as we've gone through these contrasts, which side of the comparison best describes you? Do you have saving faith or fake faith? 
In Luke chapter 8, Jesus gave us the parable of the soils. So let me ask you, are you the seed that fell on the road? Do you hear the word of God, but then the devil snatches it out of your heart? Are you the seed that fell on the rocky soil? Did you receive the word with joy as a kid, but then fell away as soon as you left your parents' house so that you could indulge the sinful pleasures of the world and do the desires of your father, the devil? Are you the seed that fell among the thorns? Has your faith been choked out by worries, by riches, or the pleasures of this life? Or are you the seed that fell on good soil? Luke chapter 8, verse 15, describes the good seed and good soil this way. They are those who hear the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. I hope that's what is true of you. Let's pray. Lord, we pray uh, that each heart hearing this message this morning would be good soil upon which the good seed of the gospel will fall and bear fruit. My prayer is that each one hearing my voice will hear the word in an honest and sincere heart, that they will hold it fast, and that they will bear fruit with perseverance. We pray this for your glory.